we are live. Welcome to Scream 2022 Review and Thoughts. R.I.P. Wes, but your legacy is safe. This movie is not called Scream 5, despite 5 looking like an A because they got sick of people calling Scream 4 Screform. Or worried this would be referred to as Five Cream, since Five also looks like an S. You know, they could have stylized the S to be a Five. Like Screams. We could call it Five Cre Five Frumps. No, that doesn't work. No, it's it's because it's a reboot, like the fourth one. I will be referring to this movie as Scream 5, just easier to keep track of. And yes, it is once again time for the Once Per Decade sequel to the Scream trilogy. And that is actually a joke that the movie basically makes itself, which I appreciate. And as other critics have pointed out, there is a reason this is called Scream, not Scream 5. Now... I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make up some time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, its length check the time codes in the description box. Now, content warning and or trigger warning. This movie features some of the following, and I'm going to be discussing some of the following potentially triggering content. Vigilantism. Torture. ableism, gaslighting, mental illness, murder, obviously, and I guess that bullying and other abuse. Now, I watched this in a theater because where I live, COVID is under control. If you do not live in an area where COVID is under control, Please do not watch this in a theater. If anybody but me can still watch this in a theater, I'm not sure. I think most people who were going to watch it have already watched it, but we got this delay because COVID. No movie is worth risking spreading COVID. Even if you think you yourself will be safe, there's probably someone you might accidentally spread it to that you do not want to spread it to. And... Yeah. So, I am currently dealing with some back pain, but still have a lot to say about the movies that I watched. So, I'm going to speak faster in at least parts of this video. And. Let's see if that brings us. So, yeah, this movie is a soft reboot or a requel, reboot sequel, as the movie puts it. I try to grade soft reboots on a curve. The reason why is because I like not being miserable, which is what I will be if I focus on all the ways that it is inferior to the original. I, I will say in a lot of ways, this this might be the best soft reboot that I've watched so far. But still, grading on a curve. Now, I don't have any personal issues with almost any filmmakers, and I almost never let any issues I might have interfere with my review and analysis. This movie did not ruin my life, my childhood, etc. Personally, I don't mind for people who aren't fans of, you know, certain movies to comment on them, review them and such. But I know for some people it is very important, only fans do. And so I want to underline, you know, I might say some critical things of some of the screen movies in this, but, you know... I've watched the first three dozens of times. I've watched the fourth one several times. I love the first and fourth movies. I enjoy the second movie, and I tolerate the third. It's it's, it's fine. It's perfectly fine. I, I don't share the... I know some people really can't stand the third one. I think it's perfectly fine. Now... Right, some... Yeah, some other soft reboots. I love Halloween 2018 and Candyman 2021. I'm okay with Star Wars Episode 7. I love Star Wars Episode 8. I really wish I'd loved Matrix 4. I've watched basically every slasher I've, you know, been able to get my hands on. You know, yeah. 
TV, Friday the 13th series, the Nightmare on Elm Street series. Now, let's see. Yeah, so this movie is rated R, and so is this video. Now, anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other parts of this franchise, the trailers and other marketing. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this video are for criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Now, technically, you don't need to have watched any other movie before you watch this one. The, this movie will get you up to speed on what you need to know about the first four. However, it is a really good idea to have watched the first four. You know, the... the a number of the things in this... A number of the things in those movies are spoiled in this. And and you really, yeah, you really shouldn't. You should definitely have watched, you know, at, at the very, very least, watch the first one before you watch this one. Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that it will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. And yeah, this is my first viewing, and I started recording as soon as I got back from the theater. And I have to admit, I don't, I'm not 100% certain when the last time. I watched the the other films. You know, I, as you can see, I have one for three, but I only have them on VHS, not DVD or Blu-ray. And my VCR, it's a long story. I know that it was sometime in the last ten years. I'm 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 almost one hundred percent certain. I I binged the first three right before the fourth one came out. And I have watched the fourth one more than, I've watched it at least twice. I've watched it in theaters, and I've watched it again years later. And, yeah, so, the plot is, for the fifth time, you know, young people in Woodsboro are being murdered by one or more killers in ghost face masks and of course we we as viewers try to figure out who is or are the killers who went mad and then stabby I'm not going to give away who and I'm definitely going to give away how many but I will say that near the end of the movie it becomes completely clear who is killing people and the performance the acting performance i i love it so much it's it's so good it's so very good i was so happy it 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 was i i almost didn't dare hope that it would be this good this this holy crap this was good so i am going to let's see so yeah Briefly, the, the other screen movies. The, the first one is an 8 out of 10. The second is a 7. Third is a 6. Fourth is a 7. So ranking them from worst to best. 3, 2, 4, and 1. And 
at the end of the review section, before I get into spoilers, I will update that list, and I will let you know what my rating for this one is. And I'm going to be perfectly honest, even if I didn't love the trailers, which I did, and the movie lived up to them, and, and actually, I've, I've seen some people say, oh, the trailers give way too much away. I completely disagree. You can watch the trailers and go into the movie and still not know. Yeah. With that said, I completely understand if you do want to, you know, horror movies are basically the one time where I, where, where I would say maybe don't watch a trailer, maybe go in without really knowing a lot. Anyway, even if I didn't love the trailers, I was almost definitely going to watch this because this is, this is one of the series that, you know, there, there is a very short list of franchises where when they put out a new entry, when a new entry hits theaters, I'm almost definitely going to watch because it's just I I I gotta know I gotta know where you you know where do they go with it and and yeah but I'm extremely happy that I did I forget exactly when I first watched I don't think it was the 90s but it was probably the early 2000s that I first watched the series so it has been part of my life for a very long time. The movie fares pretty well on diversity. You have multiple different... I hate the word race because there's only one race, the human race, so I tend to just use ethnicities. There are multiple eth ethnicities, there are multiple sexual identities, and yeah, the the you know the fact that there's that there are a number of female characters is not a surprise, but it's still good to see. You know, it's it's a screen movie. It's pretty. We kind of expect this. It would be very surprising if yeah. Getting into the writing, this was written by James Vanderbilt. Guy Busick, right, Kevin Williamson is credited as characters created by, so he didn't actually write it. But yeah, the Guy Busick wrote this and Ready or Not, and, and also, what's it, Urge. Yeah, he wrote the story for Urge, but... I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about Ready or Not when I get to the, the direction. So, yeah. James Vanderbilt. Okay, so he wrote an upcoming Transformers movie. Independence Day Resurgence. Amazing Spider-Man 2. Amazing Spider-Man 1. Zodiac. Yeah, this is... He's a very... There, there's definitely some really, really great stuff in his. Anyway, I, I don't know if James or Guy, I, I don't know which is more responsible for it, but they nailed the tone. It, I, I forget exactly, one of my fellow critics, I forget who, pointed out that, I, I forget if they said that the fourth movie was the only other sequel Actually, no, yeah, thinking about it, I think one of them said the fourth one was the only other sequel, and another one said this is the only sequel that, just like the first movie, really nails sometimes it's scary, sometimes it's funny, and it's really meta. You know, some some of the others, like, they just they don't get that balance. And it, it is an incredibly delicate balance. And the first movie nails it. Like, the first movie, the first time I watched it, I had no idea, A, that it was going to be meta, two, that it was going to be, you know, partially, like, satirical, and, and, you know, satire and meta are not the same thing. 
and and this whole yeah and if i recall i don't think i knew any of the movies they referenced the first uh, other than psycho obviously i i don't think i i had watched any of the the horror movies that they referenced in the first one the first time i watched it i've i've since remedied that i i think there's like one of them i still haven't watched but the rest of them i've watched and it's still like i i was scared you know it it really got to me and that really is like that's not a that's not a that's not a bar, a bar that it had to clear but it did and the movie is better for it and yeah this one does too like i there were yeah it it managed to balance all of those because that really is i mean that's why we go see a screen movie for that balance. Like, if you just want to, if you just want to see someone go going around killing like a bunch of of young people in in graphic gory ways, you know, take your pick. It's there's there's dozens of these movies that that will just get the you know satisfy that immediate thing. But then, like, if you, you know, there's, there's less if you, if you also want the kind of whodunit, but for slasher whodunit with meta and satire, that, I, I'm not sure anything other than Scream really fits that bill, and it's, it's so good to see it done right again. Like, this really, this... I, I I didn't really think that it was gonna be possible to do it again. And I do I do think that the fourth one came very close. And the second one definitely has interesting elements, but yeah, this is this is definitely the best since the first one. Plot twists. This one does an incredible job on plot twists. Like I did I I sat the whole time trying to guess trying to figure out what's going to happen next, who's going to turn out to be the killer, and, and the movie kept... Like, I I could never figure out exactly, and, and just... On paper, it seems like there should be too many twists, like too many times that just... But somehow it manages to... to there, there aren't too many. And I would say they're all really, really good and really well handled. So this is directed by... I'm going to go ahead and guess that it's pronounced Tyler Gillett. Who also directed 2019's Ready or Not. And... Hold on, is the, oh, I think I, for, there it is, right, Tyler Gillett and Matt Bettinelli Olpin, that duo, and they both, yeah, together, also directed Ready or Not, and apparently that movie, you know, th them having done that movie, makes them perfect for this franchise. I think I'm going to have to watch that movie now. It's on Disney Plus. I actually was going to, but then I ran out of time. I'm really excited to watch it now. It, I know, ran out of time, but the movie was delayed. I thought when they first said they were delaying this movie, they said, oh, it's going to be out like in a year from now. And I was like, I mean, okay, I guess I'll move ready or not down the list. Yikes, I, I, you know, I, there's other stuff I want to do in the meantime. And then suddenly, oh, by the way, it premieres, like, w let me see, when did I learn this was premiering? A week ago, I think. So just, yeah, I, technically I would have been able to watch it, but I kind of want to dive into it. I want to prepare notes for it and do a video on Ready or Not when I do it, but I'm really I have got to watch the movie now, and I really, really hope 
that they get to make a sequel to this. And I, I think these, this duo might become, again, I have, okay, that's technically not that short of a list, but I have a list of directors and writers that when they put something out, I'm almost definitely going to check it out. I already mentioned in the writing section the the tone, but just the 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 pacing and the staging. It's it's wild how how they're so good at this. They're so adept. They know when to make you laugh, when to scare you, when to go meta, when when to subvert an expectation, when to when to embrace an expectation, and just like yeah, I. I am in awe. Now, one of my favorite things about the first screen is these phone calls with Ghostface. I just realized I don't think I don't think I mentioned about spoilers. I will be spoiling the first four movies in this video. I won't start spoiling this movie until I get to the the thoughts section but yeah you know the 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 calls with Ghostface there are fewer of them in the later movies which makes a lot of sense because who's going to keep like once we the viewer know for a fact okay Ghostface is a killer and he's, you know, he's, he's toying with his victim. At that point, like, just watching scene after scene after scene of people on the phone with him, like, that's just not gonna keep working. You know, that's one of the reasons that I've, I've never, I don't think I've ever heard of someone who didn't really love the opening... I guess first 13 minutes or so, I forget the exact number, of the first screen, especially the first time you watch it, because that realization is just so gripping, and the way the scene just builds, you know, and if you try to do that same thing, you know, that's, that's part of the brilliance of the first movie, because you get that, that entire scene, and you're left like, you're shocked. Because, yeah, okay, slasher movie, of course there's going to be an opening kill. We know that, you know. But we didn't think it was going to be Drew Barrymore in 1996. It's like, she's, she's the biggest name in the movie. I, okay, anybody could go at any time now, evidently. You know, that's, that's not, that wasn't something that you would usually do. You know, they would usually have some no-name die in the opening. You know, it was essentially, it, it's just there to tell the audience, yes, a lot of people are going to die in this movie. But Scream went there and said, no, 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 anybody could die at any time. Because that was like, and she did a bunch of press. Like, she's on the cover. Everybody thought she was going to be one of the leads. And after that, then we see Nev Campbell answer the phone and we realize it's Ghostface. And at that point, we're like, oh, he's going to, like, toy with that. Nope, he's just going to attack her. And, you know, and, and then, like, a little later, you know, the killer calls and taunts her, taunts Sydney because her, you know, she suspected her boyfriend. And apparently, you know, oh, it, it wasn't him. And, you know, later we do realize, you know, the full truth there. But after that, you know, there's... Let's see, the second one, you know, it, it looks like Sydney gets one at the start, but then, you know, it's it's someone who who's doing it because of the movie. And then a little later in the movie, there's the call with Cece, which does have, I, I appreciate the golden line. You know, Cece, you know, she's like, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were someone else. That's okay. I am. That's That's good. That's quality and then the third one does this stupid thing where the voice changer can make you sound like specific other people as well and it's just 
I I get it. I you know they wanted to capture some of that magic again, but just yeah. I have to admit I don't remember. It, as far as I recall, there aren't very many of the calls in in the fourth movie. This one, it's not that there's like a huge amount of them, but there's more than one, and each of them they're just they're so good. I'm gonna say something, and and I I know you don't even have to tell me because I know I know how it's not gonna make any sense. It's gonna sound just like completely. The opening scene of this movie. It's it's very very close to being as good as the opening of the first stream. I know I know. You don't even have to tell me that you don't believe me, because you're going to have to watch it for yourself, and I hope you do. I, I didn't think it was possible. I hoped it. I was I was like, maybe this is when we get, you know, but I, I, it's, it's incredible. Now, let's see. Also... You know, something that a lot of slasher movies, for a lot of the movie, most of the characters don't know that there is a killer until near the end of the movie, which obviously makes it considerably easier for the killer to get to a lot of people. But movies like the, the Nightmare on Elm Street series and the Scream series, we actually find out, you know, like, from early on in the movie it becomes clear that someone is killing people and it allows these movies to explore how it affects these young people that their friends are being murdered and this movie again goes to to you know get some some really good stuff out of out of that i have to admit i think i think this was of of all the scream movies this was probably the the one that um, I wasn't expecting to care so much about the drama in the movie, but I did. I the movie got to me like it got me to really care about these characters and care about their drama and and the kind of like. Not every good horror movie has to do that or does do that, but some of them go for that, and it just, it nails it. Like several of the legacy characters, like I was like, ah oh, man, I thought that was gonna ah. Oh. Now let's see. So I've seen some criticize. You know, some some say that the this movie resembles Scream One too much, and they said, you know, it, it even Matrix Four isn't as Matrix One as Scream Five is Scream One, and it's definitely there's a lot of resemblance for sure. I thought it was perfect. I loved it. I I want more. I want more from these directors. I don't want more of this exact. I, I don't want Scream 6 to also be very Scream 1. But this, I, I, I kind of view it like with Halloween 2018. You know, they're basically just proving, no, 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 we get it. We're fans. We love this. Now, can, can we get a chance to, to mix, you know, let's, let's get nuts here, you know, and... I would love to see them get nuts. I would 100%. Others have already pointed out the kills are brutal. And right, there are actually I've I have seen critics point out that the emotional scenes really work. I don't know. I guess I just I didn't completely I didn't think it was going to work this well. And, yeah, this movie has some of the best scenes for the three legacy characters. The movie's impossible to predict. 
And uh, yeah, some, some people feel that the movie is obnoxious about pointing out negative things using meta. It's definitely, if you think that's the kind of thing that might bother you, it's almost definitely going to bother you. You might not find it obnoxious, but it's going to bother you. I loved it. I thought, I've, you know, this is what I want from screen. And let's see. Yeah, one, one critic said, you know, th this doesn't criticize, the, the Scream 5 doesn't criticize slasher movies as much as it criticizes legacy sequels and there's there's definitely some some truth to that it's very focused on that aspect and I, I i thought it worked incredibly well Right, so... Right, the... the one, one critic pointed out that the best scenes in the in the first four movies are the cat and mouse stuff where you know, Ghostface isn't just chasing or stalking, he's toying with his victims. And that's also some of the best in this. Like, there's just, it's, it's so good. This is, this is some of the best. Like, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot in horror movies of like, oh, you know, he's toying with them. He's, he's, he's not just gonna go directly for the kill. Even though he could, he's toying with them. This is incredibly compelling killer toying with kind of, yeah. And... the opening of the movie really does a great job setting the tone and just yeah giving us an idea of what we're we're in for i am not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad but i will say it fits with what came before i am extremely happy with how the movie ends it doesn't rely on deus ex machina or other convenient writing the ending, like, they did such a good job. There's there's nothing in the ending that wasn't built up to, that wasn't set up in some way. Nothing just comes out of the blue. Now, there is no post credit scene or mid credit scene or anything. Once the credits start rolling, you can, you might as well walk out. Although, you know, there will be this brief you know, the the end credits start with showing the, uh, what's it called, the cast as the, you know, the, the classic kind of thing of the, Ah, uh, let me think, what was the... What was it? Yeah, you know, the, the, the name and then their their face on, on screen. And, I, I don't know, I just, you know... For, for some reason, it, it just 
really work. I forget, do all of the others? I'm almost certain the first one had... You know what? I'm I'm not 100% sure if the other ones do or not. Now, there's definitely some nostalgia baiting going on, which, you know, for... For whatever it's worth, it's very effective, I would say. And I, I, you know, the movie doesn't just rely on that. Like, you could, this could literally be the first, ah, what's the word? This could be the very first screen movie that you watch. And at that point, you know, then there's no... Nostalgia. Now, yeah, it's, you know, there's, right, and there's some fan service, which is also very effective. And it's definitely a movie that understands the appeal of the, the first movie. And, and the sequels, but it's especially about the first movie. That brings us to the cast. So, yeah, Nev Campbell, David Arquette, and Courtney Cox, all three return as their respective characters, and Marley Shelton returns as Judy Hicks from the fourth movie. And other than that, all of the cast, and, and Roger L. Jackson as the voice of Ghostface, of course. Other than that, everyone in this, uh, you know, the, the re yeah, the rest of the cast are all newcomers. And something really clever with that is you legitimately don't know, like, there's a... Basically, the first two movies were, you know, it's you have you have Nev Campbell as Sidney Prescott, and her circle of you know her her friends, some people she doesn't like, you know, people who are dating people that she knows stuff stuff like that, you know, and then with. With the fourth one, you know, the third one, you have the whole Hollywood thing going on. A number of the, the characters are actors who are supposed to be playing people that she knew or people inspired by, you know. But the fourth one and this one, it's a new batch of, of teenagers. And so we don't know who's, who's going to live and who's who's going to turn out to be the killer and that kind of thing, you know. And that's really, really fun because that's the kind, you know. I don't, I'm, it, it works well in, in the, the second movie. And, you know, the, when you watch the first one, you have no idea that she's going to survive the whole thing. You know, especially considering, it, like, near the end, she goes against the final girl thing. She has sex, so, you know. But... Yeah, this this idea that like, cause you know, and that was that was something that they did a really great job subverting our expectations in the fourth movie because I have to admit I don't remember her character's name, but the act the the character played by Emma Roberts. You thought we we all thought oh she's the new Sydney, so she's gonna be the final girl. But then they flip it and make it that she's the killer. She does identify, you know, she does really recognize a lot of herself in Sydney, but she's, you know, yeah, turns out she's the, the killer. And that's the thing. Like, this movie, you have no idea who's, who's the final girl, who's the killer. You know, you're sitting watching all of these young people, and you're like, I mean, it could be anyone. It, any one of these people could be. I don't know for sure that they're not. And and just that's 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 where we want to be. That's you know now you're cooking with gas. 
I, I haven't seen all of them in other stuff, but I'd like to. I thought they all did a really great job. Give, they give really solid performances. And I, I know some people thought it was corny. I kind of liked that some of them are very obviously named after, you know, one of the characters' names is Sam Carpenter. You know, like John Carpenter. And one of the characters' first name is Wes. Like Wes Craven. I get it, it's kind of corny, but I appreciate that they're paying tribute to, uh, you know. I, I think I would have a problem with it if it was like every single character, but I, is it just those two? If there are others, then I am not offhand, like, spotting, go, going over the, the cast list here. You know, that you can't get excessive with that kind of thing. I forget, which, is it, is it the first of the Urban Legend movies? Or is it the second? I, I forget. But one of those, like, or is, am I thinking of something else? But there, there's at least one, like, slasher meta thing where like every character is named after a horror icon or something this is some of roger l jackson's best work as ghostface uh, you know they they gave him some really juicy material and he sank his teeth into it it's it's incredible like the fact that he's, you know, some of these actors have been living with these characters for, let's see, I guess by now it's 26 years? Holy crap. Like, if one of, if one or more of these characters had had a baby, like, when they made, like, the second or third movie, yeah, the third movie, that kid would be old enough to vote now. That kid would be old enough to drink in even the restrictive states. So, yeah. The cinematography is really great. Now, the DP is named Brett Jukovic. And other than this, oh, that's right, he also, he DP'd the Black Phone, which I'm hoping to be able to watch in, in a few months, but, yeah, I'm, I'm really, and he did Ready or Not, so, yeah. And I have to admit, I don't really know any of the other stuff that he DP'd, but, yeah, like, he, he really... He gets it exactly right. Like, it really... Like, it's not mimicking Scream just that... It, it doesn't feel like, oh, it's just it's a Scream again. But it knows when to mimic. Like, there, there are a couple of really overt shots. Not, not all of them are in reference to Scream, but there are a couple of, like, really, really... Like there's a there's a bit where someone mentions the movie Psycho and then the camera cuts and you see the shower head spray you know like yeah that that exact that that shot from from Psycho and yeah like it it has a personality of its own it doesn't feel like it's just the the first screen again and the editing is also really great handled by Michael Aller and. Oh, that's right, he also edited Jazam, which is also really... And Paranormal Activity, The Ghost Dimension. Yeah, I thought that was quite good as well. You know, some, some of the attack scenes move very fast, and the editing and cinematography do a good job of making it clear what's going on. I was... There was never a time in this movie where I was spatially confused, where I was like, but who, wait, the other character, where are they in relation to this? Or where, where are we in, in the, you know, ge geographically? 
you know, like, for example, some scenes take place in a house. Okay, well, what, what room of the house are we in? You know, how close are we? Like, with something like this, it's kind of important. How close are they to the front door? Like, could they, could they make a run for it? And, and, and actually succeed in getting away from there? You know, that, that kind of thing. And just, yeah, it's, it's, this movie's really good. And there's some really great stunts. And let's see. I've seen some say that the there are too many references to other horror movies, too much commenting on them. I thought it was exactly right. It, again, you know, this is what we go to Scream for. And that brings us to right the the score handled by Ryan Tyler and let's see uh not a lot that I recognize offhand. Okay, he did Escape Room, the ninth Fast and Furious movie, 2019 Shadow of His Angels. Oh, Rambo Last Blood. Power Rangers. Oh, Avengers Age of Ultron. Expendables 3, Thor the Dark World, Iron Man 3. Yeah, so so fairly varied movies. Yeah, this the, the the score is really great, very effective. Like it, it's really great for suspense and and tension. There were a couple of times where it was was more aggressive than I had expected, but I thought it worked. So, the best element of this movie, let's see, I, the way that the whole soft reboot thing, plays out, I think is, yeah. And honestly, I would say it's worth watching at least once just for that. And if if you have a chance to watch it in theaters, watch it there at least once. The the it is one of those movies that really deserves being seen in the theater because the sound just yeah, it's it's just it's never gonna be as effective outside of a movie theater. Let's see, the worst aspect. Mm -hmm. I am having a very difficult time thinking of anything negative about the movie. I suppose if I had to be brutally honest, while I found the the scenes of stalking and, and toying with you know the cat and mouse stuff, the specific kills themselves were a bit bland and uninspired. I thought they were effective in the way they were shot. I you know the the yeah, they they were effective, but at the end of the day, like, you know, this is a subgenre where that is part of the appeal. You know, the the you know, it's it's kind of like going to a, a musical, and you know, the the 
the people who get to do the most singing aren't that great singers and and the the songs are a bit samey that that kind of thing you know so yeah and i i don't think that's a big deal at all it, it was never something i was never disappointed now reading other people's reviews it seems like something that really bothered other people was how much it talks about toxic fandom and soft reboots and that it is very similar to the first one in a lot of ways and i don't personally think that that's a big deal the thing i was most worried about was basically something akin to Scream 3, you know, they're kind of out of ideas, they're really scraping the bottom of the barrel for something to, to comment on or to, uh, yeah, to, to explore, and it just feels kind of tired, and you're spending way too much time with characters that you're not that, yeah. And, the, yeah, the movie absolutely exceeded my expectations. The thing I was most looking forward to was more proper screen. More of this, you know, the, the phone calls and the, the toying, you know, cat and mouse stuff. And the movie exceeded my expectations. Now, that's... I right. So on Rotten Tomatoes it has 75% based on 198 reviews and an 83% audience score based on over a thousand verified ratings. And yeah, the, the consensus is the fifth screen finds the franchise working harder than ever to maintain its meta edge and succeeding surprisingly often. So yeah, only 50 rotten reviews of the yeah, and and the of the 198 and a 6.6 .6 out of 10 average rating and users the average rating was 3.5 stars or higher. Yeah, for the 4.2 out of 5 average rating. And yeah, that means the movie is fresh. On Metacritic, it has 60 out of 100 for, for critics. And for users, it's 7.5 out of 10. And on IMDb, it has a 7.3 based on 17,000 IMDb votes and yeah the so so yeah 23.4 percent voted 8 7 uh, 21.4 voted 7 19.9 voted 10 10.7 voted 6 and the rest of them are very low numbers yeah that is so yeah yeah this i i give this 8 red herrings slashed out of 10 and that means that i give this movie the same rating as the first movie and ranking all five movies worst to best goes three two four one five yes I I like it even better than the first one I didn't think that was gonna be possible but I yeah they they did an incredible job and you're obviously, you're free to disagree with me on that. Quality-wise. It would be kind of silly for you to disagree with what I 
how how I think of the movie. Anyway, getting into the right. I forgot. There we go. So getting into spoiler sections. Thought section start disclaimers. So, yeah. The rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some is MST3K, riff tracks, and other jokes. Time codes for all the sections are in the description box, and the section after right of this one is thoughts that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? Ultimately, not really, and I think that was the the right choice. You know, the the most fun of the scream ghostface killers are the ones where they're just like impossible to empathize with. They're just too too far out there. And that brings us to the next section. Let's see. Notes taken while watching. I'm just gonna say it before I get in any further. I th I think it was really cool. Apparently, they did actually bring back Skeet Ulrich for the hallucinations of Billy Loomis. That I, I at first I wasn't quite sure, but you know, I'm not sure I've seen him in anything since 1996. If I have, I don't. I I couldn't really place it. Oh, I I think I read that he was in in what's it called again? The ah, not on the tip of my tongue. As good as it gets, and I think I know who he plays in that. But yeah, you know, it's it's been a while. It's it's been a hot minute since I last saw him in anything. And you know, I mean, you could understand if they just recast the role. Although they did manage to get everyone else. I I. I kind of love that this character, like, she hallucinates a dead relative immediately. Alarm bells are going off. And you're like, so she's the killer. Like, she might not mean to be. It might be, like, a sympathetic, but she's the killer. Because we've watched a horror movie before. Thank you very much, Mr. Director. We know how this goes. If you have hallucinations about some, you know, someone that you would kill for or that has killed for some reason, you yourself are going to turn out to be a murderer. That's just how it goes in these movies. And at the end of the day, it's that she's not unwilling to murder someone. She's not unwilling to, to kill someone in a really brutal way. But she's not, like, going out there and killing a bunch of, like innocent people, you know, the only person she brutally murders is the killer. One of the two killers, you know, so that's, yeah. And I kind of love that, like, we actually, if they make a sequel and Sam is the lead, then our lead will technically be a killer, you know, so some, and, and I mean, she got pretty sadistic with it. The, the, when she killed 
Dylan Minette. I'm I'm afraid right now I'm blanking on his name. She was as brutal and sadistic with it as when the two killers in the movie actually yeah. Also, real quick before I dive into my my notepad, while watching the movie, I was like, "Have I seen Amber before? I might have seen Amber before in in something, but I, I couldn't quite place it." And then there at the end, she goes all like, you know, crazy and and sadistic and such, and I was like, "You, I recognize you." Was it? No, it was stupider than that. Yeah, whatever. I'll I'll think of it later. Seriously though, she's also really really good in in Once Upon a Time in in Hollywood, and I mean I feel like they, I mean that at this point that is just how they're approaching this, right? Like. I'm almost certain before they made Scriform, Emma Roberts was already known as a young actress who could, if the role required, get really like the the kind she she can she can seem like this this really dangerous and and focused kind of person, you know someone that you would believe would actually kill someone and yeah with with this they were like well I mean let's yeah let's get the the crazier of the of the Manson family girls and and we'll we'll make her the for so much of this movie she's so normal you know I, I don't think she was ever particularly normal in that movie because you know Manson family and everything but yeah and this like when she said, like she, you know, she tells all the all Tara's friends, "Don't trust Sam. She totally abandoned Tara," and she, you know she gives this whole backstory. And when she says that, you know, we're thinking, "Oh, Sam's dangerous," but then later realize, no, no, it's, it's she accomplished exactly. You know, she, I don't know, maybe not everybody in the audience, but she duped me. I was like, "Oh, Sam, Sam's the dangerous one." I didn't realize that that was, yeah, that was that was Amber doing the manipulating thing, and I love that, like, at the start of the movie, we think Amber might be a victim. You know, Tara keeps managing to to talk the 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 killer out of it. You know, answering the, the riddles and all this, and then it turns out she is one of the killers. And there's that thing, you know, oh, you should tell Amber, be more careful, don't let someone clone your phone. And then here at the end, it's like, I, maybe they didn't clone her phone, maybe she was actually... Yeah, yeah, that's... And I mean, I guess, is the idea supposed to be that the... I guess the, the killer on the phone and with the knife was Dylan Minnette. And he and Amber had agreed that, you know, she's going to sit there and he's going to film her so he can threaten Tara with Amber's safety. And then after Dylan Minette does that, then he goes to that other place to be with the... Ah, uh, Sam. To, and he had already, he already had a relationship with Sam. Yeah. Anyway, going into the actual... I love that the very first thing in the movie is this, the, the ringing telephone, and Tara is home alone in this neighborhood. I kind of love that the asthma thing that's so, like they set it up right here at the start and it only actually pays off like I don't know 20 minutes before the movie ends or something like that you know like really really late you know cuz cuz the moment that you see oh she has asthma 
you know that's going to come up somehow. And, like, at first, I assumed she died. I, I love that we have a slasher movie now where the opening kill doesn't die. You know, the the that she remains a character for the rest of the movie, and that's such a... Again, that's one of the... Like, we kind of accept... Oh, you know, there's going to be at least one person who dies at the very start of the slasher movie to, you know, it's just, it's expected. And nobody, nobody remembers that character. Nobody cares about that character because we're not supposed to. They're just there to set the tone. And here we have a movie that actually says, no, no, no let's, let's actually have the, you know, because the rest of the movie is about how it, like, as scary as it is when someone is actually killed, it's already very scary to have someone attacked and almost killed. And she, she lives the entire movie. She survives until the very end. She doesn't die. She's not dead by the time the, the end credits roll, nor even mortally wounded. And, you know, she could, she could go on to live a long life. You know, if they make a sequel to this in like a year, she could, you know, she she might need uh, crutches, I think they're called. But other than that, you know, she could be fine. I hope they don't. If, if they bring her back. Okay, I actually, I take it back. It would be kind of funny if they just let her off with a limp, like with Dewey. Like, that really is ridiculous how he just... Oh no, no, it's 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 fine. Just small limp from from how he got it to anyway. I I I think they did such a great job with the opening the the call when when you first watch the first screen, you have no idea that there is a like. If you have any idea what the genre of the movie is, you probably assume that there's going to be at least one killer in this movie. But you don't know that he's calling people before he reveals that. And they do they do such a great job in the the Yeah, you know, just slowly building. You know, he asks, What do you, what do you you know, oh popcorn for, for a movie, sure. What you know, what's your favorite scary movie? And all these and slowly, like he'll he'll just let a, a detail seemingly slip, and you know she, yeah, ac accidentally, you know, why do you, why do you ask me so many questions? Because I want to know who I'm looking at. What did you say? I want to know who I'm talking to, and and the. But when this movie starts, we know, you know. He's calling people. He's he's threatening people. Like we we basically guessed. We the viewer guessed this must be Ghostface. This is you know this is how it goes. It's the first scene in the movie. It's got to be Ghostface. But it's still just like I felt it was credible the way that Tara did. Like if she was if it was completely meta and she like. But that's also, yeah, she says she barely watched these movies, so, you know, she doesn't, you know, so, so she doesn't immediately think, wait, this, there's, a, some, there's something wrong here. And she's like, you know, what, she, she gets the name Charlie, and then, you know, he accidentally admits, you know, I'm in, I'm in your mother's group. Oh, I mean, shit, I'm not, you're in my mother's shit. I'm not supposed to say group. Okay, what kind of group? A, you know, and and you know she she texts Amber. Oh, I think, you know, I got my. Mm, I think my mother's boyfriend is is calling me. You know, something like that. And and then he says, you know, she's 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 so happy how. You know, she, you, you love horror movies just like she does. She's so happy she, you know, she can share that with you. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. What's your favorite horror movie? And just immediately, like, we're like, it's definitely Ghostface, you know. And then she says, 
The Babadook, because it's elevated horror, which I also seriously know. The Babadook, one of the best horror movies ever made. And, and then they start talking about the opening of the first movie, and just, I, it's, it's so good. Like, I, I, I get it. I get why some people thought that was too meta. You know, like, the, the first movie opens with them talking about the horror movies that, it, that led to Scream, that inspired Scream. And then they have Scream 5 talk about the events of Stab 1, which is, you know, Scream 1. It's just, yeah, I, I, I loved it. And I, I love, you know, the, the trailers gave it away, but it was still super effective when, you know, the, the, um, she, yeah, she, she puts the, the phone back, the, the landline back and, you know, it, it rings and then like she gets a text from, from Amber, you should answer it. And she's, you know, text back, how did you know my landline was ringing? And no response. Amber? This isn't Amber. <laughs> That's just, yeah. So. And, and the, you know, the, the phone cloning thing, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a clever new place to take, you know, that's the kind of thing that Scream 3 wanted to do with the, with the voice changing thing. And the thing of, you know, the ghost face is watching Amber right now, and if Tara doesn't get all the answers right, Amber dies, you know, and it's it's such a great, because like in the first movie, it's, that's Steve, the, the jock boyfriend of, of, nope, cannot recall her name. Drew Barrymore's character, and just the fact that, like, I don't know, I just, I felt like they changed just enough that it was really compelling. And the, the fact that the, 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 um, let's see. Like, ultimately, in the first Scream, you know, the, the Steve was already, you know, captured. So, like, again, I love that movie. I don't think it was a mistake there. But I think if in this movie, Amber had been tied up, you know, we would have been expecting, oh, then definitely going to die. And I really like that, you know, she's she's trying to answer these questions. So if she cheats, she looks up the cast on, I forget, I'm, I'm not sure if it was the IMDb app she was using or some, like, just looking it up on a, on a website or something. But, yeah. And, you know, she answers, oh, yeah, the, the role was played by Heather Graham, which, you know, that's what we see in, in Scream 2 when we see Stab. We do see that... Yeah, it's Heather Graham playing that role. And, you know, the uh, Ghostface stabs Tara, and we see the, the red and blue flashing lights. I want to was it on the, I think it was on the mask, like reflected, and they managed to get there just in time, although, you know, obviously the... Yeah, the killer wants the killers wanted her alive so that you know they Sam wasn't gonna come there if her sister was already dead, but she would show up to try to protect her. I really like when the, 
you know, the the two sisters together in the hospital, and you know, Tara is like, uh, I, I forget the line exactly, but she says something like, uh, "I want some privacy" or something, you know, and everyone starts leaving, and then she's like, "Sam, not you," and you know, everybody else leaves, and the moment that the door has closed, Tara breaks down like she she put on a brave face for everybody else because she doesn't want them to worry but she is devastated by this i i yeah it was really compelling and it's like a, a lot of movies like tara could easily have been like this really really annoying character like a, a lot of horror movies don't quite know how to balance it so they end up with just like a lead character that just complains a lot and and is constantly expressing that they're afraid and such and that like we we get why of course they're afraid but like sitting through 90 minutes sometimes more of a main character who's like constantly talking about how scared they are you know if, if nothing else happens if like if they don't like at some point grab a gun or something if they never do anything about their fear, then they're just really annoying. And yeah, Tara is not annoying. I th I thought I I I already mentioned Skeet Ulrich doing the the role of Billy Loomis again he slipped right back into that like it he he did such a good job in in this like his performance is on point the the it he, yeah he's still exact he's got he's got the 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 look that like says you know like i i feel like it almost sounds like an insult but i i mean it I say it with love. He he has he can he can do this glare that base that that says that he's going to come and stab you. You know he's and and he's he's still got it. He's still like those those just yeah. And I kind of love how cheesy. Like I think it's the very first time that he shows up and he's like taunting her saying something like I guess those it uh, what was it called um antipsychotics had just aren't working anymore are they Sam or something like that and just like that's so cheesy that's so unbelievable like am I am I watching Dexter right now that, that that's like is this still a movie, or am I just watching, like, this is, that sounded like, I, I still love Dexter, I haven't watched the new season yet, I, have, I don't have access to it right now, but at some point I probably will, you know, I, uh, yeah, just really briefly, I love seasons 1, 3, 4, 6, I, I think there's something good about it every single season, I don't hate the last season, I, uh, season 8, the most recent season I wouldn't know. But but seriously, like he just he shows up and he's like, just yeah. And yeah, and we find out, you know, Hicks is now the sheriff. And she hates Sam. Sam hates her back. Not a big fan of her front either. And I I gotta say, the scene where Sam explains to Tara, you know, this whole thing of, like, she read their mother's diary, and she learned that her father was Billy Loomis, and she, you know, she goes to talk to her mother, you know, she, she screams at her mother, and her father hears that, and, you know, he... he he didn't know that, uh, you know, that, that her father wasn't, uh, you know, and, and so she blames herself for the, 
you know, the, the father leaving. And I... It's such a clever... Because... Because that's it exactly. The... The fact that... Billy Loomis's father cheated on the on on Billy's mother which made the mother leave but Billy Loomis himself had sex with you know the this yeah Im impregnated a girl so his yeah you know so it's a generational thing and again like right there you expect oh this is the killer. That's that's the motivation. That's the that's the tragic backstory motivation. That's going to explain why she, you know not only you know okay so her father's Billy Loomis she's hallucinating him. She, you know her she has like her her family is estranged from each other and there's this whole it's just yeah I I I absolutely love it. And I really appreciate that, you know, Tara is extremely upset with with Sam about that. I like that they allowed Dewey to be a mess. Like, there really, there was almost no, like, comedic relief with him this time. He was just this much more hardened, harsher version. And I, th I thought it really worked. And, and like... I don't know if David Arquette could have pulled this kind of thing off like 20 years ago, but he can now. Like this is this is this is John Wick Dewey. You know, the the he's he's grown out some he grew some facial hair, turned out he could. And you know, yeah, he's just kind of Yeah, I I thought there there's there are almost no jokes about him. I, I'm not saying it was a problem with the, the jokes, but I think this is the way to go. You know, let's let's change up the characters a little. Because at the end of the day, like, his character didn't change hugely in those four movies. You know, like, the... the and, and that, like, I just feel like if you just want that, just go rewatch one of those movies. You know, there's, no, there's nothing preventing you. If you're going to make a new movie, change things up. And I really appreciate it. You know, the, the, I like that it didn't like end with him and Gale together. I, f I forget. Yeah, they're, they're together for all of four, from what I recall. In the second, the, yeah, they get to, they almost get together at the end of the first one. Then the second one, he's angry with her because he read the book. But at the end, they're to get, they get together. In the third one, he's working security for, is it Parker Post? No, wait. No, Parker Post is the other one, right? It's the, yeah. But, you know, he's, he's like, security for the actor who's playing Gale in Stab 3. And I feel like they also end up together in that one. You know, and this one, like, I, I really appreciate it. like killing off Dewey. I I love Dewey. I'm, it's not that I'm sitting there thinking oh, I hope they kill off his character, but it made it real. Like I I honestly wasn't sure if Gale and Sydney were going to survive. You know, once once Dewey, yeah. I like Gale's on TV and this yeah. Yeah, Dewey's oozing something else now. And I like that, you know, he, he calls Sid to warn her, and then he, you know, he just texts Gail, which she, of course, gets upset about. And, you know, for, for both of them, he says, don't come to Woodsboro. Martha Meeks had kids, and they even, they got back Heather Matarazzo, I want to say, is how you pronounce it. 
Yeah, yeah, that's... And, and I, I gotta say, I really, I'm really, really glad that we got more mooks. Because I think it's, it's... I thought I I I did like the the sort of replacements for for Randy Meeks we got in the fourth movie, Rory Culkin and the other one. I I do prefer this. I I really yeah it's it's just it's so good. I really like the bit where like she's I'm I'm afraid I forget her name Mindy. Maybe Mindy something, and she's like, you know, the the yeah, one of the one of the characters goes down into the basement to get some beer, and we, you know we're like we know how this ends, you know, so so the go goes down there and you know has to use the phone for life and does the the thing, you know, it it barely works like in the first movie when you get the beer. And you know, opens the fridge, gets the beer, and closes. And then she's just standing there, and she's like, "What are you doing? Getting beer in a dark room by yourself in a in a stab movie? You're asking for this, you know." And and then the other, let's see, the other one is like, ah, "I I gotta admit, I don't remember. I I can't completely." Recreate, but yeah, there's like she's like yeah, they yeah they talk about if the other one is the killer, and and like just yeah, I I just I love the whole thing, and I really like the criticism of toxic fandom. I like that you know. How many horror movies can you point to and say there's a shower scene, but it's a dude? I, I and and I I really did think that they were going to do the whole psycho thing that you know the the it, uh, what was it Wes that Wes was going to be stabbed to death while in the shower you know and and they also they keep doing the fake out with like. You know he's he's alone in the house, and so like I think he opens the the refrigerator, and then as he closes, like the the shot setup, and the sound design, said you know it's telling us the audience, and then the killer was right. Oh no, never mind. The killer wasn't there. Go go about your business. You know, and it's just I I get why for some people it was too much. I think there were maybe three in a row within a very short space of time. I loved it. I thought it it was just so good. And then the you know Ghostface calls Sheriff Judy and you know tells her the the you know uh, let's see yeah he tells her by the time you come home. I'll have already killed your son, you know, and she freaks out, you know, turns the car around and, and you know, speeds back to the house, runs up to the door, and then Ghostface, Ghostface was standing there, and it's just, I, I loved it, like, just, and, and imagine that, imagine being killed in broad daylight, right in front of your own house like that, just, you know, it, at, at that point, where are you safe? You know, so so just yeah, and and then after that, Ghostface does go ahead and kill kill Wes. That's I mean, there's almost some sort of like, yeah, what's the word? The the a poetic sort of not not poetic. Uh, Like the, the Ghostface told her, by the time you get home, Wes will already be dead, and technically she never did make it through the front door. So, yeah, Wes was dead before she made it through the front door. And 
yeah, you know, when he gets stabbed in the neck, that's one of the places where you really see how sadistic Ghostface is in this movie. You know, it's not just stab and then dies, but, like, we see where it goes in, where it goes out. We see the blood pumping out. Just, yeah. I really liked, you know, when, when you know, Sam realizes, oh, no, the, you know, the sheriff has been, been killed. And she spots the cop that was guarding Tara. And she's like, if you're here, who's protecting my sister? You know, and he's like, I'm, I'm sorry, but I had to, you know, and let's see. Then she runs to the, ah, uh, let me think, was it that? Yeah, yeah, she and she and Dewey run to, to the car, and then she drives, and she's got the cell phone to get, you know, and he's like, should you be doing this? What do you mean, should she be? You used to be a sheriff. You should know. No, she should not be doing that. But he's not, he, you know, he doesn't take charge. He doesn't say, okay, you know what? One of us drives, the other one does the, you know, the, the cell phone or whatever it was. Just, yeah. And... Tara, because this is a family of badasses, leaves the bed, going the wheelchair. I, I quite appreciate they keep cutting to how, like, you know, she, like, her, her hands in a cast and, like, bloody, but she, you know, she has to pressure to, to spin the wheel to, to, to yeah. And yeah, and and you know, she she gets the the, the phone. She's gonna like call nine one one, and then someone shows up. You know, and so she you know she does the logical thing. She she uses the phone as weapon, and Dylan Minette is there like, did he hit me with the phone, Dad? Seriously, though, that was that was a pretty good callback, I thought. And you know, yeah, the end, by the end of the movie, you realize, yeah, the the killer got hit in the head with the phone. You know, it wasn't by the other killer, but it, yeah. And you know, Sam's on the phone with Ghostface, and saying, "Just pick one. Just tell me, kill Sam." Or killed, I forget the, you know, Dylan Minette. And, you know, I really love that. And this is something, you know, it's the kind of thing that you kind of think about. Well, could, if, if it's a screen movie and you got Ghostface on the phone, could you maybe do, you know, after a while, Ghostface is like, you just can't pick one of them. And then Sam says, or maybe, I'm was it keeping you on the line, buying time, something like that, you know. And then Dewey shows up and shoots. The, just absolutely loved it. Yeah, stalling for time. That's and let's see. And, you know, Dewey, as a badass, you know, fire, f f empties the revolver and puts in, you know, some more bullets. And, you know, right before he leaves, he's like, if we want to be... He never dies without a headshot, you know. And so he goes back and, yeah, Ghostface kills Dewey in a very brutal way. And, you know, we knew that, of course, Sydney was at some point going to go to Woodsboro and, you know, she goes there to be there for Gale. They've come a really long way since Super Bitch. And, you know, she says, Mark is safe. The kids are safe. I would say Mark, was that the cop? from the end of, that, that she, 
started going out with at the end of the third movie. I mean, does he need protect? I, I don't know. It's, it's, you know, this is her franchise. It's not his. I don't want, uh, you know, some, some guy coming in and taking this franchise away from Sydney. And... I was scared. Of what? <laughs> I I I want to say it was Sam who said, you know, we're going to do what we should have done. What what others should have done something. We're going to get the fuck out of Woodsboro. That's such a, and and it is like why wouldn't you why would you stay? Why would you stay? There's just, there's no good reason to stay. And, you know, turns out the, you know, Tara can't, you can't find her inhaler. But Amber has one, you know, I mean, of course they're going to go to, like, don't, don't be ridiculous. Amber's a friend of theirs. They can go there, pick up the inhaler, drive off, you know. And Amber's having a party for Wes. Which is, yeah, that's a, that's a quite good, I don't even think, yeah, I don't think the sign said Wes Hicks, which is the character's name. It just says for Wes and they're partying in Stu Mocker's house where a bunch of people are about to get killed. So, yeah, you know, here's to you, Wes, you know, the, the. Your your death wasn't in vain. We're n we're not gonna forget about you. We're gonna keep your legacy alive. <laughs> I understand why some people didn't like the following joke, but I I I absolutely loved it. So earlier in the movie, Liv, ah, crap, I forget, I forget his name, Chad, maybe? I'm going to go with Chad. Liv and Chad hadn't started having sex yet, and Liv says she's ready, and Chad says no, because he's not completely 100% sure that she's not the killer, and it's just... I, I just, I think it's the perfect, because, I mean, Sydney Prescott seemed pretty sure, like, by the time she had sex with, with Billy, she felt confident, you know, okay, I mean, obviously she's not going to have sex with him if she thinks that he's a killer. And, and yeah, Chad's like, 90%, but that's not quite enough, you know, because, like, <laughs> he seriously thinks there's some chance that they're gonna have sex and then you know she's gonna end up like attacking him with a knife and so he's like that's why I can't have sex I mean I just feel like there are less ridiculous ways to tell a girl that you're no longer interested in her I, I don't know it's just I, I, I love it cuz you know this he's he's watched stab one and he's like, I mean, people are being killed just like in Stab 1. And here I'm I'm going to have sex with someone I've never had sex with before. She turns out to be the killer. I can't do it. It's, I, I absolutely loved it. I'll, you know, I'll fully grant if there were like 10 jokes like that in the movie, it would have been too much. But I, I just thought they, they hit the right balance. And, you know, he, he does the, what's it, he, he taps consent to sharing location with, you know, and then he goes out to find her and he gets attacked and he, his hand, hand gets bloodied. And so he like tries to withdraw consent, but the blood on, on the smartphone screen means that he can't get it to respond and just, yeah.
so Mindy says that she might I, I forget if she said they were gonna have sex or just make out or something but yeah they, they briefly make out and then she I, I just I I like that we have a horror movie a slasher movie where a lesbian makeout session is just like this completely offhand that like there's so many of these movies will like the the camera will leer at these women and here it's just oh yeah by the way she's gay what, whatever and she's gonna make out with another girl and you know whatever let's let's move on I really loved, like, you know, right before we find out who, right, right before we find out that Amber is one of the killers, you know, there's, yeah, they, basically everybody that's, every major character that's left that could still be the killer is, is in this small area, and it is like, I mean, any one of them could be the killer, and then... Let's see, I think, yeah, and then Amber is like, let's see, it was something like, yeah, I think, I, I think Amber said, I was alone with Tara, any one of you could be the killer. And then, like, ah, crap, what was it? Yeah, I, yeah, and then she's like, ow. Yeah, I, I gotta admit, I don't remember the exact line, but. <clears throat> yeah, she's she's like I wrote down. Welcome to Act Three, and she fires the gun and just yeah. And you know the the we we start wondering you know okay so who's who's the second killer then because. That you know, don't you can't turn your back on anyone before you know who the second killer is. And I really liked how, like the the uh, what's it called? Um, yeah, you know, once once Amber is revealed as one of the killers, she has a very stew energy to her, like. You know, really over the top and and manic and kind of, I I thought she did a really really great job on that. And you know, Sid and Ghostface both fall off the stairs, and we find out that the Lemonette is the other killer, and then they start talking about why they're doing it, and we find out you know they are toxic fans. You know, and I get why some people think, okay, that's that's kind of offensive. You know, obviously, people who, you know, yeah, to toxic fans are not, in actuality, killers. But then, you know, there's there's a lot in these movies that don't like. <laughs> in the, in in several of these movies, the the killer will say something about like how the media depicts violence and how that does or doesn't affect young people who take take in via uh, take in media i mean you know it's not supposed to be that they're saying that the filmmakers are saying if you have this opinion then you are a killer it's just they're using the movies to communicate this. But I, I did think that was, uh, um, you know, yeah, it, it felt like a very logical thing to, to do. Make the killers be toxic fans because it doesn't, you know. So let's see, the, the first one, uh, let me think, Billy wanted Let's see the the 
I gotta admit, let's see. Mickey wanted to put the system on trial, right? He wanted to get caught and then for the and and Billy wanted to get away with it. He didn't want to get caught. And he didn't let's see. Yeah, I got I gotta admit, I don't completely remember anyway, what what I'm getting at is I don't think it would have made sense to just make it the same. You know, I th I think making them toxic fans make, makes a lot of sense. But uh, yeah, you know the I really love that. You know they're like okay, so you know you're basically you're fucked now, and then Sam is like I I I freed Tara or so she says something like that. You know, and I. And and yeah, Tara basically takes she she performs the role that Sid did in the climax of the first movie. You know, suddenly she's turning the tables on. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and there's a you know Amber talks about she was radicalized online, and they they. They attack her with with a thing of hand sanitizer, and then she's got it all over her face. And you know, once once the the uh, what's it called the the uh, the knobs were turned, and so there was fire. You know, you knew where it was going, but it didn't ruin it or anything. And I, I you know, if they had tried to do it too fast, we would have been like, wait, what just happened? You know, you you need to to. You need enough setup that that the audience can follow it, so we're not like confused and then afterwards trying to figure out how it happened. You know, it, it, Stu died by having a TV thrown on, a, on to his head, which is a perfect like. He's the movies really did end up killing him. You know, so and and that you can just. You could have him just shove the TV plus the TV. They've been watching that TV for hours now, you know, so. But but with the fire, you, you need to set it up a little bit. So, you know, smash it. And she's like, hand sanitizer? Really? So, okay. She's got hand sanitizer all over her face and hands. And the, you know, then, yeah, the knobs get turned up. And just, yeah, I, I really, really loved it. And, yeah. Seeing her with with like her her face on fire and she's running and and then they have to shoot her just yeah and and Sam brutally murders her boyfriend because she's she's the heir of Billy Loomis but he is the killer so it is like I I just I love how they they twisted and turned that just yeah. And yeah, you know, all every every screen movie ends with the the final girl killing one or more killers. But this is the first time that that final girl, you know, kills them in such a brutal way. And. I quite like that, you know, Gail isn't going to write about the killers, they don't deserve it, but Dewey, who was a good man, victimized. And I really like that it's actually saying, you know, no, if, if you're, like, genetically predisposed to becoming a serial killer, no, you're going to be you're gonna be a good person. That's, I, I, I don't... Because cause at the end of the day, she does kind of embrace it. Like, it would be one thing if she was like, I'm nothing like you. But, no, she's kind of, yeah, okay, you know. Gonna get my stab on. And, yeah, I, I, holy crap, I really hope they get to make more. And I hope that if they do, that they realize, you got one of these. I, I love that they did this. I really hope they don't try to, like, I don't want the next movie to be the first movie again or the second movie again or something. Like, if they make even one more, they have to go completely in a different direction. They can't just 
yeah, but but I thought this was the exact right way to go. You know, in, in some ways, this is kind of what the fourth one tried to do, and to some extent, the the there's definitely things about the fourth one that work incredibly well. I, I do still really like this thing of turning, you know, the new Sydney turns out to be the new Billy. And, like, when she, you know, she's, like, sh scratching her face and, and attacking her, and just all this, like, I, I read, I read someone who said that they thought it was funny. I mean, I... I kind of think it was funny, but I think it was intended to be like it's 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 this kind of like darkly funny kind of thing, you know. But I I get why some people might it it it's not gonna work for everyone. But but yeah, I I absolutely love this one. I I hope at at the very least, if they don't make more scream movies, I hope they do more of this sort of thing. I hope they keep doing interesting movies that comment on horror movies. And let's see. I think I had a few other notes. Let's see. <gasps> yeah, so I'm just really quickly gonna talk about there were a couple of things that let's see. Yeah, there were some rumors that Stu was gonna be back. He's not, which is too bad. I, I think I could imagine Matthew Lillard could still do a really fun performance of a, just, yeah. And, yeah, you know, this is not the first Scream movie where the person you expect to be a victim turns out to be a killer and vice versa. I, you know, I, I put it, yeah, I... In the trailer, we see the, the smart house thing with the locks being overwritten, which was a really cool way to get scares out of new tech. You know, it's otherwise a fairly similar scene to, you know, Casey Becker, that's her name, when Casey is attacked, you know, and, and she runs up and locks all the doors manually. Today, you'd be using, yeah, smart house locks. And the idea of them being overwritten like that, that's that's a great twist to that scene. And let's see. Right. Some people have said that the second screen movies, the first sequel. Yeah, that's some some audience members had forgotten Mickey. And, you know, he didn't make a strong enough impression. He shows up in a bunch of scenes, but he didn't make a strong enough impression. This movie does not have that problem. And movies two and three are the only ones where the thing that turns out to be the motive has not been set up enough and kind of comes out of nowhere in the climax. And... So yeah, let's see. Uh, this movie, it's the it's the idea that they want to, yeah, because toxic fandom was brought up, and the this idea of like, you know, the the reasons for doing a soft reboot were brought up earlier in in the movie, and you didn't realize it. I certainly didn't realize at the time that, that was going to turn out to be yeah. And yeah. Uh, the you know in Scream Two it turns out to be a mother killing for her dead son where you know Friday the Thirteenth it's the opposite and that's not a spoiler if you, that's a spoiler for Scream One you know that spoiler is in Scream One and I'm already spoiling Scream One so yeah and yeah this one flips other things around and yeah the opening. And ending of Scream One and of this are are epic. None of the other sequels live up to yeah. And uh, right, I I didn't want to talk about this in the in the non spoiler section. I've seen some people criticize that you know oh in the trailers you see a bunch of characters being attacked. However, keep in mind all four movies that came out before this one have at least one character be attacked who isn't killed, not just not killed in that attack, but not killed in the movie at all. 
and some of the people attacked in the movies turn out to be the the killer having been attacked you know where it was staged that they were attacked and let's see That is it for this. So, let me know what you thought of Scream 5. Did you think that this was the right way to handle this movie? Did you think that they should have done it some completely other way? Do you think they should have stopped, you know, at 4 or maybe 2, maybe 1? Let me know if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about the most recent episode of The Mandalorian that I've personally gotten around to watching. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog, as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time.